uh, president of the Honor Society, Pi Gamma Mu. Um, we are honored tonight to uh, hear Dr. Ralph D. Woodward speak. He's a senior alumni. A little bit about um, Dr. Woodward. He is an emeritus professor of history at Tulane University, where he received his master's and PhD under the direction of the late William J. Griffith, and later taught there for nearly three decades. He also taught brief briefly at Wichita University, University of Southwestern Louisiana, and for longer stints at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill and Texas Christian University at TCU. At TCU, he held the Neville G. Penrose Chair in Latin American Studies. In his distinguished career, Lee has authored or edited more than 20 books, contributed more than 30 book chapters, and nearly 50 journal articles, and more than 100 book reviews, not to mention numerous encyclopedia articles, booklets, and pamphlets. He is perhaps best known for his book, Central America, A Nation Divided, a work that did much to elevate and professionalize Central American history and histor historiography, and for his great opus, Rafael Carrera and the Emergence of the Republic of Guatemala, 1821 to 1871, for which he received the award Alfred B. Thomas Book Prize from the Southeastern Council of Latin American Studies in 1995. Lee was a popular and inspiring teacher, a wise and generous mentor, and a public intellectual who made his voice heard, particularly in Central America's deadly decade of the 1980s. He directed more than 30 doctoral dissertations at UNC, Tulane, and TCU, and a number of his students have gone on to make their own important contributions to the history of Latin America, Central America, and the Southeastern borderlands. In 1996, Lee was named Louisiana Humanist of the Year, and in 2002, he received the Distinguished Service Award of the Conference of Latin American History. He has also been singled out for his for special rec recognition by the Southern Historical Association, the Congress of Central American Historians, Central Methodist College, his undergraduate alma mater, Tulane University, and the Acad Academia de Geografia y Historia de Guatemala. Sorry. <laughs> and it's my honor to introduce to you Dr. Ralph Lee Woodward. Thank you. Thank you, Taylor. It's, it's a real pleasure to be here and to see so many of you tonight to kick off our homecoming weekend tonight. Uh, it gives me a it's a real privilege for me to come back and give a second Gaddis lecture. Uh, for Merrill Gaddis, more than any other member of Central's faculty of the early 50s, for me represented the excellence of that faculty and his dedication to scholarship. He actually was a model for my own teaching style for over 45 years of college teaching, an inspiration for my research and writing. I'm also indebted to Pi Gamma Mu, which was founded in Central by Merrill Gaddis, of which I was proudly a member during my student days here. Gaddis's daughter, I think, put it especially well in her brilliant 1987 lecture she gave here. She said, the low star he was and has once more become for me. I know he often was from the outset for his other students. The example he set is probably more obvious when those students have become educated themselves. But I believe even the least serious student must have felt, even if he or she did not articulate it, that his moving classroom presence, presence in the, in the French sense, approaching, approaching charisma, was not just a discreet side to his personality that came into play when he stepped up to the lectern, this lectern, uh, and went back into the briefcase when he stepped down. Professor Gaddis's classroom personality was simply the public sign of his genuine self. There were many others, of course, to whom I'm indebted for the solid undergraduate education I received at Central. Notable was Jim Cullen, who taught me Spanish. I'm also greatly indebted to Fred Comer with his broad historical vision, to Tom Perry, who made me pay attention to the English language, and to Louis Johnson in political science, who directed my honors thesis. Nor should I omit my father, 
who was president of Central in those days, was responsible for me being here at all, and often shared with me his views on education. Until his return to Missouri in 1950, my upbringing had been in New England, giving me some of the attributes of a Connecticut Yankee that I think I never discarded entirely. My Missouri experience was brief, five years in all, most of it at Central, before I left Fayette and spent most of my professional career further south. That notwithstanding my elementary and secondary education in Connecticut's fine public schools, my parents' deep Midwestern roots were always present. Perhaps symbolic of that was the fact that from my er earliest memory, I was a St. Louis Cardinal fan instead of close to home Red Sox or Yankees. And I absolutely hated the Brooklyn Dodgers. <laughs> They're not in Brooklyn anymore. <laughs> my idea for this evening was to review some of my experiences in Latin America and reflect on the history of that region. My professional career spanned some 50 years, nearly all of it teaching and writing Latin American history. As I look back over those active years, I've become aware of how much revolution was a theme for 20th century Latin America. Despite having achieved some stability in the late 19th century, in the 20th, it became noted for its instability and, and revolutions. The earlier stability had largely been a result of classical liberal parties that established military dictatorships dedicated more to economic growth and maintaining order than to political democracy. Exploitation of the labor force to produce agricultural and mineral exports characterized those regimes. Upper class oligarchies dominated each country, while most of the population was underpaid and overworked. The tiny middle sectors associated themselves as best they could with the upper classes. But the wealth engendered by the export led economies eventually brought growth and diversification of these middle sectors. And in the 20th century, they challenged the old order. The 20th century opened with a peaceful revolution in Uruguay that made that state a model for democratic evolution. But it was followed by the violent Mexican Revolution beginning in 1910 that set the tone for nearly a century of social and political upheaval, coming from both right and left, fascist to communist, from Mexico and Cuba in the north to Chile and Argentina in the south. Revolution or military coup rather than elections became the usual mode of changing governments and advancing 20th century ideologies. As late as 1950, in several Latin American states, elections still had never resulted in the opposition party replacing the party in power. That by the 1990s, there had been considerable democratization and the emergence of serious middle classes with more broadly based political parties having replaced the old elite liberal and conservative parties in most Latin American states. Looking back over my half century of active involvement in Latin America, I realize, how, I realize now how, how close I was to some of those revolutions. It began in the summer of 1954 when Central College professor Jim Cullen encouraged Ellery Johnson and I, for me, to attend a summer session in the state of Michoacan, Mexico. The passion and violence of the Mexican Revolution had largely passed by that time, but there were visible traces of it left. Michoacan had been the home of Lazaro Cardenas, the leading revolutionary president who served from 1944 to 40 and inaugurated some of Mexico's most revolutionary policies. Cries of Viva la Revolución Mexicana were still heard at public meetings and there, were plenty of, there was plenty of evidence of revolutionary and counter-revolutionary struggles there. It was during that summer that the United States Central Intelligence Agency and military advisors helped right-wing Guatemalan exiles overthrow the government of that country. Mexican university students actively protested the CIA intervention that overturned the democratically elected government of Jacobo Arbenz, ending 10 years of progressive rule there and bringing to power oppressive military rule that lasted more than 30 years. It also brought an end to Franklin Roosevelt's good neighbor policy of non-intervention. I first became aware of Guatemalan politics at that time, but I didn't pursue it much further until I became a graduate student at Tulane from 1957 to 60, following a stint in the Marine Corps, where my battery commander 
had been one of those military advisors in, in 1954 in Guatemala. He briefed me in considerable detail on his experiences there. Tulane's Latin American program was especially strong in Guatemala. My thesis director was a prominent historian of Guatemala, and under his direction, I wrote a master's thesis on Guatemalan urban labor unions and their role in the revolutions of 1944 and 54. It was while I was at Tulane that Fidel Castro came to power in Cuba. There were many Cuban exiles at Tulane, but the strong-armed right-wing dictator Fulgencio Batista had closed the university in Havana. I was a dormitory advisor at the time, and several of those Cuban students who lived in my dorm went downtown and took over the Cuban consulate in New Orleans on news of Castro's victory. Then they quickly returned to Cuba, leaving me with a homemade pistol they had used to take over the consulate as my senior of Cuban Revolution. <laughs> Soon after, over spring break, I and five other Tulane students drove to Key West and flew over to Havana to see what was going on firsthand. In those days, you could fly from Key West to Havana for $10, even graduate students could afford it. <laughs> Fidel was still at the height of his popularity in Havana, having only just begin, begun the sharp turn to the left that soon made that island a communist model in the Americas. Our visit lasted only a week, but it was a revealing glimpse of one of the most important revolutions of 20th century in Latin America. Research for my doctoral dissertation took me to Guatemala for the 1960-61 academic year. I still remember vividly my first day in Guatemala. My wife and I had driven across Mexico the last 200 miles on a railroad flat car, the Inter-American Highway not yet completed. Traveling in mid-May 1960, we had hoped to proceed the rainy season when many Guatemalan roads suffer landslides or become otherwise impossible. impossible. In fact, happened this, this year quite a bit. We were unsuccessful in that endeavor, and after clearing customs at the border, facilitated by gifts of Mexican rum and American cigarettes, we ran into heavy rain along the new Pacific Coast Highway. We had not gone very far before we came to our first No I Paso road closed sign, and proceeded to follow a series of poorly marked detours through the coffee farms on the Pacific slopes, getting new directions from the inhabitants at each indigenous village we passed through. Crossing over rickety and swinging bridges, we were immersed in the most beautiful and luxuriant green foliage I had ever seen in my life. The indigenous people protected themselves from the rain with giant banana leaves, although in more recent years, these would be replaced by great sheets of plastic. Somehow, we came out at Mazatenango, where we found a squat of a little hotel to spend the night were progressing more easily the next day to Guatemala City. In November 1960, Cubans supported Guatemalan exiles invading the country. But the Guatemalan Army and Air Force, supplemented by U.S. counterinsurgency advisors, pushed the invaders deep into the rugged mountains. From there, they launched a guerrilla war following Fidel's Cuban example. Quite by chance, my wife and I had rented a bungalow right across the street from the Guatemalan Air Force Base. From there, we had a clear view of the B-17 bombers taking off to attack the leftist invaders, personally led by Guatemalan President Miguel Davis. Then, during the following spring, we watched from our front porch as the Bay of Pigs invasion organized and took off from the same field. It was obvious that the pilots of those unmarked planes were North Americans. The invasion force, made up of Cuban exiles, had been trained in Guatemala under the supervision of U.S. military personnel, an activity carried out openly with little effort to disguise it. During that year, I made an automobile trip through the rest of Central America, uh, when, when the American, Inter American Highway was still more of a project than a reality. It gave me a first-hand sense of the differences and similarities among the Central American states, as well as some experience in their respective archives. This trip included an unscheduled interview with Nicaraguan President Luis Somoza. I was searching for the Nicaraguan National Archives, which was supposed to be in the National Palace. Although fire, I knew that fire in 1931 had destroyed most of its documents. On the main floor of the palace, I found no sign. There were the offices of the various ministries, a 
and one leg of presidencia. School in the idea that it's often best to start at the top and work down. I presented myself to President Simos as attractive receptionist, who graciously informed me that the National Archives, what was left of them, were in a small wooden shack on the roof of the house. But she asked me if I wouldn't like to meet the president. I said, sure. She ushered me into his plush executive office and introduced me to His Excellency as, quote, a distinguished scholar from the United States. <laughs> we chatted for about a half an hour about politics in our respective states. When Luis learned that I was from Louisiana, he took special interest. He told me that Nicaragua was now having elections, quote, just like Louisiana. <laughs> <laughs> Opening the drawer of the table, he pulled out a stack of bumper stickers to prove that he knew how things were done. <laughs> The ease of visiting Central American presidents would eventually erode, but not before I had found presidents of Costa Rica, <coughs> El Salvador, and Guatemala equally accessible. During the same trip, Nicaragua and Costa Rica were in an undeclared state of war along their common border. This delayed our passage somewhat, but without mishap, while we listened to tirades from either Nicaraguan or Costa Rican officials about their counterparts across the border. On my return from Central America, I taught history at Wichita and then the University of Southwestern Louisiana. Although teaching heavy loads in both those schools, I found time for some research and turned my attention toward Cuba, essentially applying the methodology I had used in my master's thesis to that country. I was greatly aided in, in, in uh, this effort by the cooperation of communist, the Cuban Communist Party Secretary Blas Roca and the Cuban Ministry of Labor with documents and publications. The resulting article was my only publication in Cuban history, but I continued to teach Caribbean history throughout my career, uh, often combining it with Central America in a two-semester course that at Tulane called Middle America. In 1963, I moved to the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. That appointment called on me to switch my research to the Southern Cone, Argentina, and Chile. A Fulbright Fellowship soon put me in Chile for 15 months, where I lectured on U.S. history. I arrived there at a particularly tense time in 1965. Chile was suffering hard times, and the centrist Christian Democratic government of Eduardo Frey was under heavy pressure from both left and right for more radical solutions. Complicating my teaching there was the recent expose of Plan Caroline, a Pentagon-originated Cold War scheme to, quote, study, classify, and weigh all the elements of social, political, and economic pressure against the, uh, against the uh, established system to make it possible to predict and politically influence significant aspects of social change in the world's developing countries, close quote. Chileans saw this as an intervention in their internal affairs, and it exploded as a major scandal at the very moment I arrived. Leftists and even some Christian Democrats in the parliament described Camelot as, quote, a foreign power's plan of espionage against Chile. Quote. And Washington itself was forced to issue a statement that said, we have suggested to the corresponding authorities that the application of Plan Camelot in Chile be suspended. Yet a Pentagon spokesman admitted on July 8th that the project, launched by the Army's information services, was functioning in various countries, including Peru, Colombia, and Chile and that, quote, a great number of specialists in social sciences of international reputation had contributed ideas and information referring to communist subversive attacks, close quote. In this highly politicized situation, the university campuses were hotbeds of protest and reflected the national political party structure much more than does political activism in U.S. universities. Leftist students boycotted my classes, leaving only Christian Democratic students enrolled at the National University. I later learned that routine reports on the university situation that the American Embassy requested from me had been forwarded to the CIA. If I was an unwitting CIA observer, the other side was also represented by a rather pleasant Russian writer, supposedly a KGB observer, with whom I sometimes had coffee along with Chilean colleagues at the university. All of this was part of the background to the election of 1970 that brought in Dr. Salvador Allende 
as head of the first socialist government in the hemisphere to gain power by the Chilean election. Three years later, however, the Chilean army, with U.S. assistance, overthrew him, ushering in the repressive dictatorship of General Augusto Pinochet. Another manifestation of the Cold War in Chile occurred a little later, when our embassy's cultural attaché <coughs> and asked if I would teach a summer course in U.S. history at the National University of Concepcion in Southern Chile. But the chairman of the history department there, whom I knew, uh, he was a communist, and he insisted that I couldn't do that unless a companion course on Soviet history was also offered by a Russian, with students required to take both courses. Well, the, so the Soviet cultural attaché agreed to teach such a course, so I moved my family to Concepcion, but the day before classes were to begin, the Soviet professor pulled out, scuttling the whole program. This actually worked to my advantage because it gave me the summer free and allowed me to finish the book I was working on on Chile's offshore, offshore islands, a book entitled Robinson Crusoe's Island. By the time I returned to Chapel Hill in the fall of 1966, campus there was aligned with resistance to the Vietnam War, as well as demands for greater student participation in university governance. I spent the summer of 1967 in researching in Spain, still under the yoke of the fascist dictatorship of Francisco Franco. The vast difference in political climate and culture between Spain and France, where I also spent some time that summer, was inescapable. Yet change was in the air. And by the time Franco died in 1975, when I once more was in France and Spain directing Tulane's junior year abroad programs, the wheels were already turning for the establishment of a democratic constitutional monarchy. When I returned to Spain for extended stays in 1997 and 2000, the blossoming of democracy once more in Spain was notable and refreshing. And Spain's democratic progress in the late 20th century was a direct and beneficial example for much of Latin America. Meanwhile, in 1968, I had been in Argentina on another Fulbright lectureship. Despite economic problems there, I could not but be impressed by the relative prosperity of Argentina and the high level of worker wages and benefits compared to other Latin American countries. This was the legacy of the Peron Revolution, 1946-55, which although fascist and military, brought important social advancements to the country, much as the controversy of Huey Long had done for Louisiana. Perón's wife, Ava Perón, who had died in 1952, deserves much of the credit for Perón's dedication to working class improvement. Perón had spent his early career in Italy during the rise of Benito Mussolini, whom he much admired. By the time I came to Buenos Aires, Peronismo was still a major force in the politics of the country. Perón returned to power in 1973, but he died the following year. His party, however, gradually more democratic, con continues to be the major party in Argentina to the present day, and, and the current uh, president uh, is a I returned to North Carolina in the fall of 1968 amid rising student and faculty activism and academic revolution spreading across the country. By the spring of 1969, the students and faculty had shut down the university, the campus occupied by the State Highway Patrol. The taste of revolution hung strongly in the air before I left UNC to become professor of history at Tulane in 1970. This brought me once again into closer contact with Central America, focusing my research there and directing summer sessions in Guatemala and Costa Rica. I traveled frequently to the Isthmus and became more closely acquainted, especially with leftist opponents of the military regimes that characterized all of those states, except Costa Rica. The publication of my general history of Central America in 1976 won favorable acclaim in the region and opened many doors for me. By the late 70s, I was spending more time in Nicaragua, coincident with the rise of the Sandinistas. The 1972 earthquake that destroyed Managua triggered economic and political change quite apart from the physical damage. I had accepted an appointment to the editorial board of the Nicaraguan Journal by that time, and I was also at work on a book on Nicaragua for Clive Press and Oxford. The journal had for some time been a publication supported by the Conservative Party, and more specifically by the Zavala family, prominent in Conservative Party politics and descendants of the 19th century president. 
as in much of the rest of Latin America, 19th century liberal and conservative parties, each representing different factions of upper class elites, had dominated politics. In that Nicaragua, these old parties survived longer than elsewhere, but by the mid-20th century, they reflected something of, a, of the opposite of what those terms generally are thought to mean in US politics. Thus, the Liberal Party was the stronghold of the right-wing Somoza family dynasty, whereas the Conservative Party represented a more socially conscious opposition that claimed greater allegiance among peasants and workers. As such, it became the principal opposition to the Somosas, although one wing of the Conservatives did collaborate with the Somosas and returned for a guarantee of a third of the seats in the national legislature and an occasional cabinet position. The 1972 earthquake, however, revealed that the Somosa regime was not all powerful, and its inability to stem the crime wave that followed the earthquake in Managua encouraged more Nicaraguans to overtly oppose the government, allowing the Marxist Sandinistas an alliance with the conservatives and other opponents of Somoza to gain ground. <coughs> I became actively involved with President Jimmy Carter's Central American policy about that time, including supporting his decision to recognize Panamanian sovereignty over the Panama Canal. During my visits to Nicaragua, I was well acquainted with our ambassador there from 77 to 79, a University of Illinois sociologist named Mauricio Solano. He implemented Carter's somewhat timid policy of trying to house Somoza without a victory for the leftist Sandinistas. There was obvious U.S. concern over the Sandinistas and their connections to Cuba and the Soviet Union, so that Carter sought to ease Somoza out in favor of a pro-business group representing both the old conservative and liberal parties. I recall being present at a dinner at the ambassador's residence one night at which the editor of the conservative newspaper, La Prensa, Pedro Martin Chamorro, and his wife, and later president of Nicaragua, Violeta, along with three other prominent Monago businessmen, the president. Ambassador Solaun openly encouraged them to step up their anti samosa activity, suggesting that a business strike aimed at shutting down the economy might force the dictator's resignation. The businessmen, however, expressed great reluctance to make any overt moves against the government without assurance that the U.S. would send in troops to defend them against expected reprisals. As long as the Nicaraguan National Guard remained loyal to Somoza, they felt, it was too dangerous to move over overtly against the regime. Solomon could not give them such an assurance. Not long after this, henchmen of the dictator assassinated the highly respected Chamorro, an event that became a catalyst for massive uprisings resulting in Somoza's ouster in July 1979 and the subsequent takeover of the government by the Sandinistas. My close relationship with Javier Savala opened doors to many of those involved in the revolution, including not only conservative leaders such as Chamorro and his wife, wife Violeta, but also more active revolutionaries, including Daniel Ortega, the current president of Nicaragua. At one point, a local TV camera caught me at an anti samosa rally and the next day, President Somoza on TV, much less cordial to me than had been his brother 20 years earlier, by implication called me a communist and declared me unwelcome in Nicaragua. <coughs> the Somozas were soon gone, however, and the 1980s was a decade that involved me frequently in discussions involving the U.S. role in Central America. This included consultation with CIA and State Department officials on several occasions as well as frequent lectures and seminars on university campuses, one of which was my earlier Gaddis lecture here. Guerrilla warfare was rampant in Central America by that time. For not only was there the counter of war supported by Honduras and the U.S. against the Sandinista government in Nicaragua, leading to the Iran Contra scandal, but bloody conflicts also inflamed El Salvador between Marxist and right-wing extremists with the moderate Christian Democrats called the middle. And in Guatemala, the leftist guerrillas also continued their war against the military dictators supported by U.S. counterinsurgency forces. Atrocities multiplied, and some 200,000 Guatemalans died or disappeared during that war. International pressure finally forced a free election in 1985. 
brought my friend, Christian Democrat, Benicio Cerezo to power. Cerezo, in collaboration with Costa Rican President Oscar Rojares, brought about first ceasefires and then peace accords and free elections that by the 1990s paid rich dividends for the region. Arias received the Nobel Peace Prize for his efforts. Although in many ways imperfect, it brought peace to Central America and a degree of democratic development, replacing a century of unstable governments in most of those states. In fact, the last two decades have seen considerable stabilization, peace, and prosperity all across Latin America. With more pressing problems in the Middle East, Africa, Asia. Latin America has recently received less news coverage, in large part because of its stability. It has achieved, the, the stability it's achieved, and the infrequency of revolutions there since 1990. Latin America has been the most successful continental third world areas in debt management and repayment during the last half century. My own research since 1990 turned more, back more to the economic history of the Spanish world in the early modern period. It has always been tempting to compare the development of the United States with Latin America, or what Argentine political theorists Juan Alberti called the disunited states of America. And indeed, the lack of unity among the Hispanic states has been one source of their underdevelopment. For several years, I taught a course entitled The Comparative History of the Americas in which we contrasted the disparate economic and political development of Anglo and Latin America. The history of respective European colonization of the two regions reminds us that the disparity between the two regions was not always so one-sided. Latin America's colonial period was, of course, much longer than North America's, extending from 1492 to about 1820, even longer than Cuba and Puerto Rico. Moreover, the nature of colonization was quite different in Latin America, a few Spaniards conquered vast ancient civilizations and then forced the indigenous peoples to work at very low wages. In North America, more often, the indigenous peoples were simply driven off or killed, allowing for the development of family farms that formed the core of a European-style middle-class capitalist economy in the North, often with labor shortages that promoted higher wages. Nevertheless, after the violent Spanish conquest of the 16th century, Spanish America settled down to a fairly prosperous existence with large deposits of gold, silver, and other minerals that provided for a brisk trade in other goods, agricultural and manufacturing, and enriched both Spanish merchants and the colonists who had settled there. These Creoles, as they were known, Spanish born in the, Spanish born in the New World, prospered. And in the 17th century, they enjoyed considerable autonomy from the declining power of the Spanish Empire, which was being supplanted by English, Dutch, French, and French maritime and mercantile power. Meanwhile, much more interested in the lucrative production of the Caribbean and mainland Latin American regions, those colonial powers tended to ignore their own Atlantic seaboard colonies, allowing them to develop largely as subsistence economies with a high degree of self-government by default. But things changed notably in the 18th century. Spain's rivals had penetrated Latin America's trade, the British controlling as much as 50% of it by 1700. Spain sought to recover that trade and joined France and other European nations in resisting the rising British power. Britain belatedly began to demand more from its own colonies, encouraging more export production and imposing new taxes on the colonies. After decades of relative autonomy under this salutary neglect, these British policies led directly to the American Revolution of 1775. But Spanish efforts to reassert its control in Spanish America had a similar effect, as those policies challenged Creole autonomy as they demanded higher export productivity in the mines and plantations, causing indigenous populations also to rise in rebellion from Peru to Mexico albeit largely without success. The successful U.S. rebellion, after some difficult times, led to rapid U.S. economic growth that facilitated the Industrial Revolution in this country and eventually our own colonial expansion, first westward, but later southward into the Caribbean Basin. 
Independence in Latin America came more slowly, but was eventually intricately linked to the French Revolution and the Napoleonic Wars. Independent states resulted, but they became bitterly torn between truly conservative and liberal parties throughout the 19th and well into the 20th centuries. This was unlike the United States, where traditional conservatives, the Tories, had largely fled the colonies, many settling in Canada or the Caribbean. Letting the United States develop politically with two political parties that both had their roots in 18th century liberalism. In Latin America, deep divisions over questions of church and state, economic policy and free trade, centralism versus federalism, and policy toward the large indigenous populations tore apart each country and made them more vulnerable to foreign economic domination, first by Great Britain, later by France, Germany, and eventually the United States. Thus, in the 19th century, <coughs> and well into the 20th century, the United States soared economically as Latin America stagnated. It turned increasingly to dictatorial governments that focused excessively on agricultural and mineral exports that enriched foreign corporations and small native elites, but impoverished the rural working classes who gradually lost their lands and freedom to the plantation economy. Yet these export enterprises, coffee, bananas, sugar, copper, tin, beef, oil, whatever, inevitably demanded skilled labor and local managerial and other services. That contributed to the growth of middle sectors, not so large as in North America, but nonetheless increasingly demanding the share of the economic and political pie. A struggle throughout the 20th century, which I've already alluded. Throughout most of the 20th century, these middle and working classes organized and pressed for greater participation through labor unions, new political parties, <coughs> mobilization of university students and faculties, women's organizations, and other popular associations. There were many ups and downs in this seldom unified struggle, but by the 1990s, Latin America appeared very different than it had a century earlier. Nearly all of the states were now democratic republics. Elections made a difference in most, and the small upper classes had both become much more complex and been forced to share power with representatives of the middle and lower sectors. Governments have changed by elections during the past 20 years, and only the 2009 coup in Honduras being a minor exception. Neoliberal economic philosophy characterized most of the governments, emphasizing private enterprise, but with significant government oversight. In the 21st century, Latin America has achieved notable stability with few revolutions since 1990. To be sure, we hear about Venezuela's sharp turn to the left under Hugo Chavez, and occasionally of Ecuador or Bolivia's similar direction. In fact, most of Latin America has turned toward the left or center left, the pink tide, as some have called it, more influenced by Western European models and by Brazil than by the US. The past half century has witnessed, witnessed substantial class struggle with the emergence of stronger middle and working classes that have won political and economic strength. Widespread poverty and instability has not disappeared, and it is plain that there could be more turmoil ahead. Even so, we have a more mature Latin America that is coping better with economic realities and globalization, and often providing leadership in crisis areas in the Middle East, Africa, Asia, and even Europe. There are also lessons for our own country, for in many ways, in the last 30 years, we have moved, moved closer to the third world model of too much of a gap between rich and poor and more extreme political parties. And as much of Latin America has prospered, poverty has widened in the United States. In comparing the rise and fall of great empires, the startling similarity of Spanish experience with that of the modern U.S. is disturbing. Spain's effort to maintain and pr protect its huge domains led it to spend ever-increasing revenues on military and naval expansion, leading to huge deficits and eventual bankruptcy, leaving 19th century Spain a third great power, worshiping its past and ignoring its future well into the 20th century. The fall of the Soviet Union was another case of an overextended empire bankrupting the nation. The United States, following the British model of the 19th century, 
was a more informal empire than either Spain or the USSR, but it has become an empire nonetheless, with armed forces and economic interests spread thinly over a huge global area and involved in colonial wars against hostile peoples. It is hard to avoid the conclusion that the American empire must, like its predecessors, scale back from overseas adventures and look more carefully to the development of its own peoples. The good news is that the post-imperial development of the European nations has led to a more prosperous and viable lifestyle than most of those former mother countries. Perhaps no discussion of contemporary Latin America can ignore the question of illegal migration into the United States, especially from Mexico, Central America, and Colombia. While immigration has been a vital part of U.S. development, it is only in the 20th century large, uh, that it became illegal. The natural flow, largely for economic motives, of foreigners into this country has been not only a major part of our history, but has largely been a beneficial, albeit not without some problems. Nativist protests against such immigration have, have also been common ever since the colonial period. There is a certain irony to the current problem if we remember that much of the early Anglo migration into Louisiana, including Missouri, Texas, and the Southwest was illegal when Spain, first Spain and later Mexico owned those territories. Recent efforts, as well as the declining economy, have succeeded in greatly reducing the flow of Hispanic Americans into this country. It's less than half the number it was during the Bush administration. But the real problem is not so much the porous border as it is what to do with the 12 million illegal aliens already here. As a recent New Yorker editorial put it, quote, the mass deportation fantasies of some restrictions notwithstanding, the great majority of illegals are here to stay that's a good thing, since they are, for a start, essential to large sectors of the economy, beginning with the food supply. The Department of Labor calculates that more than half the crop pickers in the United States are undocumented. The problem of illegal immigration has been left to fester for decades. Every effort to address it has provoked a groundswell of angry obstructionism and demagoguery. Disingenuous calls for border Greater border security are now part of that obstructionism. The president blames, quite rightly, congressional and Republicans for blocking reform. But plenty of Democrats, both in Congress and in the state houses, have no stomach for tackling the issue either. Certainly not in an election year. It is time, nonetheless, to try to find, finally bring millions of men, women, and children in from the dark. Close quote. Well, Latin America, despite significant indigenous preservation and customs in some areas is solidly a part of Western civilization. Like the United States, it was profoundly influenced by the classic <coughs> liberalism of the 18th century. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, as it was stated in the United States, or liberty, equality, and brotherhood, as the French put it, both influences were powerful in Latin America, and both implied not only liberty and equality, but also democracy. And in both North and South America, the demand for more democracy has been a constant over the past two centuries. In both regions, the demand for liberty and democracy has not always been compatible with equality or brotherhood. Democracy in Latin America has sometimes led to demagoguery and tyranny. Equality before the law has often been a goal rather than a reality in both regions. And liberty has sometimes threatened equality as it has simply meant the liberty of the few to exploit unfairly the poor and downtrodden, for whom liberty has little tangible benefit. Yet the experience of Latin America in the past two decades provides grounds for optimism, and I am optimistic, about their progress towards stable, democratic, egalitarian regimes, which have now been the rule rather than the exception. I thank you for your indulgence allowing me to reminisce and reflect on a bit of Latin America's modern history. If anyone has any questions, I'll do my best to respond.
concludes this year's version of the Merrill E. Gaddis Memorial Lecture. Thank you very much, Dr. Woodward, for coming and speaking with us, and thank you all for coming and listening. Have a good night. Cookies and lunch next door. Big announcement.